Hello and welcome again. I think I'm on. Welcome again to Terrain Gospel Ministries to the Gathering Place. Um, I'd like to finish up this series in on Roman Catholicism or seducing spirits and doctrines of demons in Roman Catholicism uh, with this last message, and I've entitled it "The Greatest Anathema." And in it, I want to talk about a lot about salvation and the Catholic Church's false view, false teaching on how one must be saved through them. And if you're relying on the Catholic Church for salvation and eternal life afterwards, you're being deceived. There is no eternal life afterwards if you're going through the Catholic Church for salvation. You can only go one way. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the greatest anathema. The Catholic Church, I'm going to follow up uh, 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 read later on, uh, the Catholic Church has pronounced many anathemas to scare and intimidate people, to uh, not say anything against their teaching, to just follow along. It's unbiblical. Their teaching is unbiblical, but they pronounce these anathemas and a great threat of being excommunicated from the church and damned or cursed to eternal hell fire because you don't follow or you question the doctrine of the Catholic Church. They pronounce them through time. We're going to read several of them. And then I want to talk about what the Bible would call the greatest anathema. And uh, before I start, oops, I should have turned this thing on. But before I start, um, I just want to bring up here in my last video, one of the things we you know had some changes in our mind, in our lives and all, which is they've been fine. But one of the things that happened is I drowned my phone and I lost all my contact list. I know people have made some faces just there now watching this. It's like, hey, drowning your phone. Eh? Um, I lost my contact list. So some of you who are subscribers, I hope you're still subscribers. And please, if you feel that this is helping anyone, please subscribe. And please pass this on to others with likes or whatever. I'm not all into that whole thing. But just get the word out that these messages can help people. It's not about me, it's about them. That's our, Lorraine and I, our, Lorraine in this picture back here, our primary concern is to help people learn about Jesus and to be free from the trappings that are in the world today, especially through religious and religion and religious organizations. Um, however, if I haven't contacted some of you people, it's because I've lost your number on my contact list. And so if you'd like to email me or text me back, you guys have my number, text me back, email me, anyone, please email me at uh, terraingospelministries at gmail.com, terrain with an E, T-E-R-R-A-I-N-E, gospelministries at gmail.com. Let me know, give me your number, and I can at least keep in touch. I apologize for that. I just, I didn't have any backup. I, I've learned my lesson. I have it backed up now. So please do that. Um, let's start here. <clears throat> with the, the main scripture I will use later on in this little session here is from Galatians. I want to start with it as well. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. Um, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. I'm going to point that out. Pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. That word is anathema, the one the Catholic Church likes to use. It means damned, cursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed, anathematized, anathema. So what's he talking about here? Gospel. He's talking about the gospel of salvation. The only way a person can get to heaven. And that is something that is proclaimed, that is something that's explained through the gospel. The gospel simply means good news. The gospel is the Greek word for meaning good news. The gospel of Christ, the gospel of salvation. Our ministry, Terrain Gospel Ministries, we use as a foundation scripture, Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those who believed. 
our little statement is that we proclaim the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, without apology. How can I apologize for what Jesus said is the only way to eternal life? In fact, I want to proclaim it more and to help people realize that is the only way and to help them find that. This session here, greatest anathema. Previously, we talked about the priesthood. We talked about their position on confession and repentance and penance, I should say. And then we summarized that all with patron saints. And we realized, as we pointed out all of that stuff, that all that stuff is very non-biblical. In fact, it's very heretical in much of it. And their position that they've taken as priesthood, they've uh, established themselves as priests. Uh, contrary to what the Bible says, they said that they've come down through the line of Peter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they just keep making themselves priests. They lord over the people as priests. They're the only ones who can forgive sins, do the the mass, et cetera, et cetera, minister communion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, and, and yet they uh, have protected themselves in many ways, even when they have deemed themselves to be above everything and closer to God by being celibate. And then when they do these perverse, wicked things within churches as pedophiles, they don't get excommunicated for that. They get hushed up, sworn to silence, moved on, and the church does damage control in court cases and pays money out to shattered lives and victims. And that's what they brought it down to. Rather than change their doctrine and say, no, if you, are, if you want to be a priest, you should marry because you're going to burn with lust if you don't, etc., etc. They have done it that way. It's caused a great amount of havoc and trouble. And they threaten people with all sorts of things if they tend to want to reveal that or expose that. I've taken a lot of heat about doing this series, by the way, and uh, from other people who made comments, etc., etc. But I'm exposing the lies. The main thing, the main thought that we're going to see in this session here is around salvation. What they say the gospel is what they say a person needs to do to obtain salvation and eternal life, and what the Bible says. And we're going to find out how they protect that. And what the Bible says is very bad if they do try to protect that. They talk about false salvation. They really give you a false salvation. It's a substitution for what the Bible says. They say you need to be saved through works, through baptism first, then doing works, or receiving the sacraments to keep yourself in some state of grace, like we mentioned. And then if all that doesn't work out, they've got purgatory where you can atone for your own sins long enough to get you cleansed and eventually able to get to heaven. That's what they teach. And we've talked about this in the past, in previous videos, especially with purgatory. The Bible talks about what you need for real, true, eternal salvation. It's real simple. You need to be born again. <clears throat> There's no other way to get your sins washed away. There's no other way to be regenerated, made alive in your spirit. You need to be born again. You put your faith in the grace of God. You put your faith in the cross where Jesus died for your sins. The Catholic Church, in our previous video, they called it, you bring your failings to the church. God didn't call them failings. Jesus didn't die on the cross for failings. He came to save the world from their sin, not their failings. You need to be washed clean of your sin. If we call them failings, it's not that vital to us to have them really changed, is it? But sin is deadly and dangerous. And it's sin that separates us from God. We're going to look at that. You put your faith in the cross of Jesus Christ what he did on that cross, his blood that washes us clean, and his saving grace that changes us. That gives you eternal life in heaven. Not sacraments, not baby baptism, not what the Catholic Church teaches. Okay? I want to talk a bit about salvation. I want to talk about our, our situation and why we need to be saved. First of all, we're lost. Everybody without Christ is lost. You, you're a sheep and you have no shepherd. I'm not talking about your pastor or your priest or the pope or whoever. <clears throat> you need Jesus Christ as your true shepherd and follow him and him alone. You're lost. Matthew 18, 11 says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That's us. And your sin, not your failings, your sin separates you from God. Wall of separation. You're separated from God. 
Your sin separates you from God. That's why you need to be cleansed from it. Behold, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. I think I mentioned this as well, last one. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. That's what sin does. You're separated from God. You're in the kingdom of darkness. His face is hidden from you. You have to go through Jesus to God because of what Jesus did on the cross. Something even more serious, you know, we talk about the Catholic Church condemning you to hell and passing their judgment and anathema and cursing on you. Never mind the Catholic Church. You are, without Christ, condemned already. So the Bible says, he tells us. That's why this is very serious. And yet, the wonderful part is that he tells us how we can be freed from this and how we can be saved. You're condemned already. We all know this verse, John 3.16, but then there's more afterwards that really explain it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Most, most people can quote that or have heard that. Okay? Now listen after this. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved need to be saved because you're lost. You're drowning in an ocean of sin. And you're too far to swim to shore or safety. You need him to save you and take you out of that ocean of sin. Cleanse you. Put your feet back on ground here in his kingdom. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He came in the world to save the world. Okay? Now listen. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You reject Jesus, you're condemned already. You're, you're condemned already. You're condemned already. However religious, however self-righteous, however Catholic you are, you're condemned already because you are refusing and you haven't gone through the only path, the only door to salvation, which is Jesus Christ. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Is that you today? But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done by God. That's the reason why people are condemned already. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and he asks you to come to that light. But in our sin, we love our darkness, because if we know we come to the light, our evil deeds will be exposed to the light. And we tend to hide that, and we stay away from God, and we try to do things our way. The Catholic Church wants to keep you there just as well. Just come to church every Sunday or however many times you need to go to confession and you'll be okay. We'll just keep forgiving you of these things that you keep doing, your failings, and you'll be okay. You won't be okay. You won't be okay. Reconciliation. You need to be reconciled to God. Ephesians 2.16, and that he, Jesus, might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. That's how we need to be reconciled. That's how he did it for us. Now we have to go through that path to get to God. We implore you, 2 Corinthians 5.20, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. How do you do that? Well, you need to be born again. You need to come through Jesus Christ. He said it. I'll read it. The story is, is, is the, the statement is made in John 3, verse 3 to 7. Jesus answered him. Nicodemus came to him. One of the Pharisees, one of the priests, came to him and asked him some questions. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, 
and that which is born of the Spirit of Spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Please don't marvel at this. Jesus is saying, you got to be born again. You know why? He's telling you the only answer to the question. There's no theories. There's no possible multiple choice. A few of them could be right. Just get the better. No, no. He's telling you the one answer. How do you have eternal life? You need to be born again. Period. You need to be saved. Like we mentioned before, Acts 2.40. Peter said, you need to be saved from this perverse generation. This is Peter talking here. We'll get to that in a minute. He also said uh, in Acts 2.21, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter's talking about being saved. This is how you be saved. You call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Peter said that. Yet the Catholic Church says Peter is the first pope, that everything, that it all comes down through Peter, and yet they claim Baby baptism is how you get saved. Peter didn't say a word about that. Peter never baptized a baby. If he was the first pope, and they agree in what I called, what I talked about in previous uh, previous video, about their oral tradition, then they're totally throwing their oral tradition out the window. Because Peter says you need to be saved from this perverse generation. You need to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Not be baby baptized. Not do your confessions. Not go through a priest. Not follow a denomination. No, 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 no. no. They have made that up. Contrary to their talk about oral tradition being passed down from Peter in succession through all of those marvelous popes all down through the line and keeping that all pure. No, it's not pure at all. It's very not pure at all. And it's right there in the Bible. Peter said you need to be saved by calling upon the name of the Lord. That's what he said. Redemption in the Bible is through the blood of Jesus, through faith in him alone, not water or baptism or anything like that. Water doesn't wash away your sins. Remember I said Pontius, Pil Pontius Pilate tried that. Once he knew Jesus was guilty, he's in a lot of trouble. He's condemning this man to death. And he goes and washes his hands. Here, bring me some water. Wash his hands so he can be free from that man's blood. He was not free. Only the blood of Jesus can wash you away from sins. Only he can forgive you. Never mind the water. Water's good for cleanliness and hygiene, not sin. Ephesians 1 and 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. 1 John 1 and 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of any works. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Yet the Roman Catholic Church says that baby baptism, sprinkling of holy water, sacraments, works, that's how you get saved. Totally contrary to the Bible. The Catechism, Catholic Church Catechism, and I quote, Salvation is by baptismal regeneration as an infant, which removes original sin and returns one to a state of innocence. It is then maintained by meritorious good works and the infusing of grace through the reception of the Catholic sacraments. Unless, oops, Unless a willful act of sin is committed that breaks the state of sanctifying grace. Oh my, what happens now? Unless a willful act of sin breaks that state of grace. You're okay unless you have a willful act of sin. So what they're stating here, or what they're confessing here in that statement in their catechism is, there's no guarantee for your salvation. You're sprinkled, you hope you're okay. Gee, did I make a... Sin that broke my state of sanctifying grace, that doesn't give you a great guarantee. Quite frankly, the Catholic Church, by their own statement right here, does not give you an assurance of salvation. The Catholic does not have the assurance of heaven, according to following their doctrine here. Do you have a problem with that? Is that a problem for you? Is it? But the Bible tells us Contrary to the Catholic Church, the Bible tells us you can have a guarantee. 
You go through Jesus Christ to be saved, you will be sealed with the Spirit as a guarantee. Scriptures. God, 2 Corinthians 5, 5, God who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. In Him you also trust that after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the word of truth, Bible, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, given as a guarantee. He is the guarantee. Jesus, John 20, 22, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is after He had risen from the dead. He had, he had come walk through the wall, met with them, breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He told them, this is the, about the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 49, he says, You would receive the promise. Wait on him. Go and tarry in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they did that and they were filled with the Holy Spirit to give them power to live this life. It's all through the Holy Spirit. It's not through sacraments, not through baby baptism, not through any good works. It comes by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? No baptism. No baptism. This was Peter. Peter, Peter. Remember Peter. And this is the same one that they say is their first pope and everything has come down through him. And not very long prior to this statement that Jesus made with them when he breathed on them and said, you need to receive. Here, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Jesus told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Same guy. Get thee behind me, Satan. It didn't all get passed down through Peter. It comes through Jesus Christ and through his Holy Spirit. True salvation only comes by believing the gospel, the word of God, and you put believing faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. John 1 and 12. Contrary to what the present Pope and Catholicism teaches, when you're baptized, regenerate, where did I read that? Salvation is by baptismal regeneration in an infant, which removes your original sin, etc., etc., and receives one of the state of innocence. No. You don't enter, a you're not a child of God by getting baptized as a baby. You're not born as a child of God. The only way you become a child of God, and we mentioned this way back in one of my other videos about, you know, are you a child of God? Are you sure? Contrary to the teaching, especially of the Catholic Church, not everyone is a child of God. You have to do something to become a child of God. John 1 and 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, hold on, not of blood, but of the will, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's why Jesus said in John 3, born from above, born of God, born again. Spirit made new. And that's how you become a child of God. If you received him through Jesus Christ, then he gives you the right now to, to be entered into, adopted into the family of God. Acts 16, 29. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is the Philippian jailer talking to, asking Paul and Silas. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They, and he was told this simply, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Not go to church, not do any rituals, not join the church, not be baby baptized or baptized. What must I do to be saved? He says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. They were saved that night. Romans 10, 9 and 10 reads this, part of what we call the Romans road, that if you confess with your mouth, Here's what you need to confess, the Lord Jesus as being Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now that word believe is, is, not, is a word of faith. It's not just believe in your brain here. It needs to be put your entire faith and trust and hope in him. Believe what the Bible says. Believe that, that, that to be true. Believe and be saved. With the, for with the heart... One believes unto righteousness. Not the head. The heart believes unto righteousness. 
and the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's what the Bible says about salvation. But I'm going to look at some of these anathemas I talked about earlier. We're going to go long today. Don't even bother looking at that uh, hourglass. I'll have to turn it over twice. But here's what the Roman Catholic Church says about everything that I just talked about. Here's how they refute it. Here's how they are on the other side of this and says, no, you don't need to do that. Here's what you need to do. They have a, a statement that they make. I believe this is Latin. I'm not very good at it. Never was. It, it says, extra ecclesiam nulla salus. I think that's how you would say it. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus. English, outside the church, capital C, outside the church, there is no salvation. Their statement. Now that is in contradiction to everything I just read from the Bible about what Jesus says, about what God himself says about salvation. How you need to be saved, what you need to do to be saved, why you need to be saved. They said, nope. Nope. Never mind that. They must have been wrong. We've got a better plan. Salvation, no one gets saved except outside, outside the Catholic Church. You must be in the Catholic Church. You must go through the Catholic Church for salvation. That's what they're saying here. Extra ecclesiam nulla salus. 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 Outside the church, there is no salvation. That's what they say. Let's look at some of their catechism again. I'll say item 824. It is the church. It is in the church, excuse me, it is in the church that the fullness of the means of salvation has been deposited. God, according to them, gave them the fullness of the means of salvation. He gave them, he deposited to them, he, 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 he gave them the only way for people to be saved. Item 846, basing itself on scripture and tradition. Remember this oral tradition one? I don't know how they can say they base themselves on scripture, but oral tradition. The council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. Item 868, the true church is Catholic, according to them. They would say that, wouldn't they? They are Catholic. The true church is Catholic. She proclaims the fullness of the faith. She bears in herself and administers, she bears in herself and administers the totality of the means of salvation. That's what they say. Um, back at the time of the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Reformation sort of kicked off. It was started before that, but basically through a man called Martin Luther in 1517, he went and nailed a, they call it the, the writ, uh, the 95 Thesis on the door of the church at Wurttemberg um, in Germany and uh, basically said, the church, here's where you're wrong on 95 items here. And he was a Catholic priest, by the way, at the time. And he realized it was wrong. God gave him light to see and he nailed that on the wall and that started the deal. They wanted to kill him and they chased him and did all of that stuff. You can read all about that in history. But uh, they went into high gear and damage control because they're starting to be exposed here. And, uh, yeah, and Martin Luther went on to translate the Bible uh, into, the, uh, into the German language. So the actual people who didn't know Latin, but yet the church kept them in bondage of Latin. We talked about that a while ago in another video. He let the people know. He translated the Bible into their language, their vernacular, and allowed them to know what the Bible was saying, which was very contrary to what the Catholic Church was saying. And other men did that and gave their lives for it. Like William Tyndale and, and those men who translated the Bible into English, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to expose and reveal the lies of the Catholic Church and to allow the people to make their choice to know what the Bible said so they could be set free and have eternal life. Catholic Church at that point in time went into major damage control and uh, tried to, you know, stop the bleeding and started and made many anathemas to threaten and intimidate the people uh, so their thinking wouldn't be changed uh, as they learned what the Bible was saying and they wanted to maintain their position here of control over the people. They had something called the Council of Trent and I believe, I believe it was about 1545. So they had, you know, 
thrown together this emergency session type thing and made up some anathemas. And they started to brand people as schismatics and things like that. We're going to read some of this. And primarily they were targeted at what they call the Protestant, the people who protested the Catholic Church's ways of doing things. They were called Protestants, Protestants as we know them today. I'll read. Council of Trent in 1545 deemed as one of the Roman Catholic Church's most ecumenical councils. It was the big one that they had because they were in full-on damage control here. Prompted by the Protestant Reformation, it pronounced several anathemas or curses or damnings upon, guess who? The Protestants. Protestants are automatically sentenced and branded as schismatics, sectarians, and heretics if they don't submit to the Pope. Or they knowingly reject at least one point of Roman Catholic dogma. Or they knowingly believe certain ideas that the Roman Catholic Church explicitly condemns. Or have their own churches. You dare break from the Catholic Church and start your own church or your own gathering. Ooh, you're, you're, a, you're a heretic according to the Catholic Church. And they burned people at the stake. Murdered them is the, the real word. Um... For, for doing these things. You don't believe the Catholic Church, you get rounded up, you get arrested, you get tied to a stake with a bunch of brush around your feet and they ask you if you will denounce your belief or they'll set the torch to that brush and many people say, no, we're not denounce it. You guys are false. We believe in the one true God and we believe in the Bible and the fire was lit and they were burned at stake. This is his history. This is history. You can read about it. Again, it's, uh, it's all in this book, and I'll tell you more about it at the end. A woman rides the beast. Consequently, all such Protestants are deemed to be outside the salvation of the Catholic Church and therefore are consigned to the fires of hell. Their statement. Pope Benedict, the, uh, let me see, XVI, that would be the 16th. Pope Benedict the 16th, July 10th, as recent as 2007. He said this, one church in Christ consists, subsists in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is the one church in Christ. Protestant communities cannot be called churches in the proper sense because they lack apostolic succession. That is, the ability to trace their leadership back to Christ's original disciples. Therefore, they and all other denominations are lacking the fullness of the means of salvation, seeing that they lack the Catholic Church, which is necessary for salvation, seeing she, the Catholic Church, and she alone bears in herself and administers the totality of the means of salvation. And therefore all others are anathema, condemned, and cursed. Pope Benedict. Here are some of their uh, anathemas. Canon 9, one of the Council of Trents. If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the, to the obtaining the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared or disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. Basically, if you say that by faith alone you can be saved and you don't have to do anything else after that to be saved or maintain salvation, they say, nope, let him be accursed. The Bible says differently. They say, no. If anyone, canon 12, if anyone saith that justifying faith is nothing else but confidence in the divine mercy which remits sin for Christ's sake, or that this confidence alone is that whereby we are justified, let him be anathema. Canon 24. If one saith that the justice received is not preserved and, all, and also increased before God through good works, never mind the Holy Spirit, before God through good works, but that the said works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not a cause of the increase thereof, let him be anathema, cursed, damned. And here's what the Bible says, as we've read it before, Ephesians 2, 8, we are saved by grace through faith alone, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. They're saying, nope, you believe that, that's anathema, you're cursed. Ephesians 3.12, in whom we have boldness and and access with confidence through faith in Jesus. They say, nope, you don't have access through Jesus, you have access through the church. Let him be anathema. 1 Peter 1 and 5, this is Peter, their Peter, same Peter, saying this in 1 Peter 1 and 5. We are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Faith for salvation. Ready to be revealed in the last time. Same Peter in his second epistle, 2 Peter 1, 5 to 7. For also, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Virtue, then knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godly, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. He didn't say, now add to your baby baptism these things. He said, no, add to your faith. That's what you need to be saved. Faith, not baby baptism and sacraments and just going through the motions by what the Catholic Church says. He said, no, no, add to them your faith. Faith, faith, saving faith. Luke This is Jesus speaking now. This is Jesus. Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He didn't say your baptism, your religion, your works. He said, no, your faith. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Mark 1, 14, 15. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is, God, is at, God is at hand. He said, repent and believe in the gospel. That's Jesus' words. He didn't say be baptized. He didn't say do some good works. He didn't say receive any sacraments. He said, repent, turn around, repent, change your thinking, metanoia, turn Go in the direction of God now, never mind the direction of the world, or religion, or denomination. Go in the direction of Jesus through the Bible. Repent, turn, follow the Bible, Him. And believe in the gospel. That's how he, That's what he came preaching. He didn't, came, he didn't come preaching, be baptized. Interesting too, Jesus didn't baptize anybody to be saved. He didn't baptize anybody. If it was all about baptism... If it was all about just simply washing in water, then why did Jesus have to go to the cross? John the Baptism was doing a good job. If it was only baptism that was required, John the Baptism came. Why did Jesus have to take over? Why did Jesus have to go to the cross? If it's only baptism. Jesus didn't baptize anybody. He said, no, you repent to be saved. You got to come through me. Nicodemus, you need to be born again. You don't need to be baptized. You need to be born again. You need to put your faith and belief and trust in me. Jesus was speaking, the Messiah, the Son of God. You need to be born again. Put your faith and trust in him. Not works. Him. So with all of the, everything I just said, all of these scriptures that I just read, statements by Paul, statements by Peter, Statements by Jesus, stating, saved by grace through faith alone, repent and believe. Woman, your faith has made you well. Peter said, you know, we're saved by the power of God through faith for salvation. It sounds like all of these guys, and I say that very reverently. I don't mean to be irreverent. All of these men, Paul, Peter, and Jesus himself, obviously are cursed under the anathemas of the Council of Trent because they taught this and they taught people to believe this and yet the Catholic Church or the Council of Trent says, you believe this, you're cursed. That's what they said. Are they cursing really? Paul, Peter, Jesus? It sounds like they are. Here's some more anathemas and I'll finish up here. These um, um, Council of Trent, the Catholic Church was uh, pretty upset by the Reformation to say the least. Because the Reformation was exposing their corruption and their lies. And it was made public. And they went into hyper, as I said, mode, damage control mode. Because their corruption and their lies were being exposed. And their false teaching. 
and it was being made public, and they went into mode to, as I said, pronounce these anathemas, these curses upon people who challenged them, who, who were saying, uh, this is not right. And they went into this full-on mode of, you believe us or you will die. We curse you. And eventually they rounded them up, they prosecuted and persecuted, I should say, and then prosecuted and sentenced them to death, many of them. This is all history in the, in the Catholic Church. You can read about it in this book right here. And many other places. It's just all condensed and put into one book here. Canon 25. This is where they now, we talked about indulgences. You can buy indulgences back then from the Catholic Church. So then if one of your loved ones died, oh my goodness, not in a state of grace, and they're now in purgatory, you give money to the Catholic Church, they will cut a bit of time off of his sentence in purgatory. That he, according to their teaching, is paying for his own sins, contrary to the Bible, quite heretical. But you don't challenge them on that because they have Canon 25 as a anathema against that. Whereas the power of conferring indulgences was granted by Christ, their statement, to the church. And she has, even in the most ancient times, used the said power delivered unto her of God, the sacred holy synod teaches and enjoins that the use of indulgences for the Christian people most salutary, beneficial to them. Salutary. And approved of by the authority of sacred councils. They are to be retained in the church, and it, the church, condemns with anathema those who assert that they are useless or useless or deny that there is in the church the power of granting them. You basically say anything against indulgences to the church, according to the Council of Trent, you are anathematized, cursed by them. They say indulgences are good. Jesus gave them the, the power to do that, according to them. So you dare say there's something against that, or they don't have the power to do that, or that they're useless. You're cursed. Canon 30. This one talks about purgatory. That's another good one that they have to keep you coming, keep you in chains, keep you paying, because you've got a soul in purgatory, you can buy indulgences for, for that. And even if this doesn't work out, by doing all of their teaching of salvation, if you do die, and oops, you could have some sin, then you'll go to purgatory and you can pay that off in penalty and flames by yourself. Nobody, nobody, nobody can pay for their own sin. That's why Jesus died on the cross for you. You can't pay for your own sin. You can't wash your sin away. The Christian hymn, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's why he went to the cross. So purgatory is a fallacy. It's a way to keep you hooked into the Catholic Church. It's a fallacy. There is no purgatory. There's nobody there. There's heaven or hell. No place in between. However, they say purgatory. If anyone saith that after the grace of justification has been received to every penitent sinner, the guilt is remitted and the debt of eternal punishment is blotted out in such wise that there remains not any debt of temporal punishment to be discharged either in this world or in the next in purgatory before the entrance to the kingdom of heaven can be open to him, let him be anathema. So they're saying, okay, you get justified through their sacraments, through the church, but you still got this temporal kind of a sin. You're still a little dirty. So between you and heaven is the cleansing station, purgatory, and then you got to go there, get yourself totally cleaned up, and then you can enter into eternity in heaven. They're saying, if you say anything against that, that, that's, that, 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 that is not true, you're anathematized, you're cursed. Canon 32, this one is about good works. If anyone saith that the good works of one that is justified are in such manner the gifts of God, as that they are not also the good merits of him that is justified, or that the said justified by the good works which he performs through the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is, does not truly merit increase in grace, eternal life, and the attainment of that eternal life, and also an increase of glory, let him be anathema. Basically, they're saying that if you say 
that the good works of one that's justified, basically a Catholic, saved Catholic in their version of salvation, that the good works that you do don't also give you more grace, more eternal life, more attainment of eternal life, and more increase of glory by the nice works that you do here. See, that's how they canonize their saints. You got to do something really cool and good. They're saying if you, if, you, if you don't believe that to be true, you're cursed. So I want to wrap this up. It's getting late here, and I'll see what best I can do. I want to talk about... So they just pronounce a whole bunch of anathemas, basically on salvation, basically on uh, purgatory, good works, certainly their indulgences. But the primary one that I spoke of first on was their salvation. They say that if you believe that you can't be saved except through the Catholic Church, if you believe what the Bible to be true and them to be false, you're cursed. That's what they say. They call that an anathema. And it's powerful. It used to frighten people. They were the ones that set themselves up as, in their past videos, you know, the only one from God, the big pyramid coming down like that that they were the only ones who could access to God. They were the ones given the power and control through Peter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they were the ones that told you this is the way it is. Never mind the Bible. We'll, we'll read that for you. You, can't, you don't have the ability to interpret it. That ability has been given to us by God. And that's what they say. And keep you in the dark, keep you just following along, and keep you on the hook. And the only way you can be saved is this. And now they actually come out and say, if you believe anything else about salvation, about what the Bible says, about what Paul and Peter and Jesus said, you're cursed. Don't believe that stuff. I'm going to talk about something God pronounces an anathema. Did you know that? We just read it at the very start of our session here. God pronounces an anathema through the Bible, through the, through the words of the mouth of Paul. When he said, look, at if, if you preach any other gospel than the one that's in the Bible, the one that was given to Paul by Jesus Christ himself, he said, let him be anathema. I think the Catholic Church is in a lot of trouble. Because they're cursed by God right here. Never mind the Catholic Church passing an anathema on you. Who cares? Good if you're excommunicated. Good if they say, oh, we don't want you anymore. You're cursed. No, good. Keep going away from that curse and come to salvation in Jesus Christ. That's what you need to do. Because the Bible says there's a great anathema coming. And I'll call this one the greatest anathema. Jeremiah 17 and 5 says this. This is the Bible. We're done talking Catholic Church doctrine here. Let's just talk about the Bible and wrap this up, okay? Jeremiah 17 and 5. Thus saith the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. That's God speaking. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Cursed in the man, like the Catholic Church doctrine, who promotes this who puts their faith and trust in the works of a church. He said, cursed is that. Makes flesh his own works. Makes man his strength. Whose heart departs from the Lord. It sounds like the Catholic Church's heart has departed from the Lord. Seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Likely. Back to the book of Galatians here. 3, 1 to 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Back up. Paul wrote the letter to the church at, in uh, Galatia because after he had preached the gospel, in come the Judaizers right behind him, preaching false doctrines and saying, this salvation through Jesus alone, eh, okay, it sounds fine. You know, Paul... Paul's just kind of radical. He's kind of narrow. So here's what you need to do. You know, really, Jesus was Jewish. So you really need to expand and become more Jewish. Okay? You need to follow Jewish doctrines. You need to follow what the Jewish, you know, circumcision and this and that and this and that. You need to do this. If you want to do that, then you'll be more complete. You will be more saved. That kind of sounds like the Catholic Church, doesn't it? You'll be more saved. Do better works. Follow these rules and laws. 
as well as what Paul says, and you'll be better, okay? That's what the Judaizers came to tell the Galatians. And the Galatians were like, oh, they were really... Um, Paul wrote them a letter, a very strong letter. You read the book of Galatians, very strong letter. And he says, hold on here. There's only one gospel, only one way. You don't add anything to it. You can't take anything away from it. Jesus said, this is how you get saved. I told you what Jesus said. Not another gospel. I told you the gospel. And that's what you, that's how you got saved. So if you started off that way, why do you think now you have to go back and follow these rules that these men are telling you to maintain salvation or to keep that? Putting your trust in, in the arm of flesh, the doctrines of men. He writes this, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed, among you as crucified, the cross. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? Did you receive salvation? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by baby baptism, by sacraments, by following the doctrines of the church, receiving sacraments and rites and ordinances? Is that how you receive the Holy Spirit? Can't. You can't. Paul's question, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh, by the works that you do? No. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And we read this, in at, we read this at the start. There's only one gospel. The one that Jesus said. The one that Jesus told his apostles. The one that Jesus told Paul. Only one gospel. Faith in Jesus Christ. I marvel, writing to the Galatians again, I marvel that you were turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Same word, anathema. God pronounces this one. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. If anybody preaches any other gospel than the one that Jesus says on how to get to heaven, he says, let him be accursed. That's the greatest anathema. Being cursed by the Catholic Church? Oh, please. Please. Being cursed by God? Not good. That's bad. Very bad. The gospel. What's the gospel? Real simple, real simple. Wrap this up. Jesus died for your sins. He paid the price on that cross. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He took the penalty of our sins upon him. Romans 4.25, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin was made sin so that we could be made into his righteousness. He took our sin so we could have his righteousness. That's what happened on the cross. He died on that cross. He shed his blood, the innocent for the guilty. The innocent for the guilty. God for man, the innocent for the guilty. That's what happened on the cross that day. He died. He was buried. Went to hell. Paid the penalty for sin. He stripped the devil of his power over death, defeated the power of death, took the keys, and raised, was raised from the dead. Romans 4.25, when he, when we were justified, he was raised from the dead. When we were justified, he was raised from the dead. Gospel, simply, Jesus Christ died for your sins took the penalty for your sins. Your sins have been now been washed away. You, he died, 
he was buried, and then to show he was God and the power that he has over death, he rose again. If you are in Jesus Christ, you will rise again as well. There's no purgatory. You will rise again as well. And for this reason, God says, because he did what he did for all of mankind, I have exalted his name and set it high and at, above every other name. And at the mention of his name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus. Salvation, Jesus alone. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus speaking. No one comes to the Father except through me. He made it simple. He made it simple. One way, one answer, one door, Jesus Christ. No church, no denomination, no sacrament, no ordinances. Jesus, repent, salvation. We have redemption, Ephesians 1, 7, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. The seriousness of this matter is this. Two last scriptures. You need to be saved, and you need to have the Son of God. 1 John 5 and 12. He who has the Son has life, eternal. He who does not have the Son, S-O-N, does not have life. You don't get the Son, S-O-N, by baptism, by water, by ordinances, by sacraments. You get the Son only by your repentance and turning to Him. To as many as received Him, to them He gave the right, John 1 and 12, to become children of God. You only receive the Son by being born again. You get the Spirit of God. That's the only way. One way, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the door uh, by which the sheep enter the sheepfold, heaven. Okay? Romans 8 and 9, it, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. That's a serious statement. If you don't have the Son of God, you don't have eternal life. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not God's child. You're not. The Gospel, real simple. This is the Gospel. There is no other Gospel. Jesus died for your sins. You need Him. He rose from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's the door now. You go through to get to heaven, to get to the Father. There's no purgatory. He's the door. And you do it out of repentance. Repent in your heart. And you receive the free gift of God through salvation. The free gift of God. He gives it to you, not by works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We are saved by His grace through our faith in what He's done. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Otherwise, I did this to get myself to heaven. No, no, no. You can't do anything to get to heaven. You can't be nice enough, rich enough, Beautiful enough, important enough, you can't. None of that cleanses of your sin, and that's the problem, sin problem. So you need to be saved from your sin. Turn to Him. Turn to Him by the gospel. That's the gospel. Any other gospel that is told you by a denomination or a friend or a website that tells you you can go to heaven any other way. And we are in these end days, everybody. Listen, we are in these end days. I have more videos to come on this. We are in these end days. Much deception, many false teachers, much falling away, much blended mixture of spirituality and new life and new age, much to deceive you. Jesus says, be, be careful, don't be deceived. There's only one way to heaven. And there's only one gospel. And that's the gospel that he says in the Bible on how you get saved. Whether a church tells you something different, 
a person tells you something different, or whether you have made this up in your own mind, your own life, taken this and this and this from some buffet of life and says, yeah, this is, I got a good relationship with God. Me and God are good. We're, we're tight. No. You're basically condemned. And if you teach that to someone else, worse than condemned, you're accursed. That's what the Bible just read in Galatians. So don't do that. Turn to Christ, know the truth, believe in him and be saved. False teachers, they'll be cursed by God. That would be the greatest anathema to ever face. God bless you. Listen, um, I feel to pray here. If you don't know Jesus Christ, and I've told you the gospel, God as my witness, you just need to turn to him and ask him. I just witnessed to a young lady the other day on the street, lives in our building here, and just she was good with God, and, and she had her reasons and, and uh, had seen a lot of hypocrisy in the past, likely in churches, and I understand that is there all the time. But don't lose your salvation or your eternal life because of someone else's hypocrisy and how they choose to live for Jesus. Don't do that. And if you don't know how to do this, it's pretty simple. It's basically a prayer to say, you know, Lord, I'm a sinner. I realize I'm a sinner and I need your salvation. I've been resisting, rebelling. I'm lost and I need your salvation. Please save me. Please wash me clean of my sins. Please forgive me and please save me. Make me a child of God. Please bring me into your kingdom. I want to live for you. I want to know the truth and I want to help others find the truth. Give me the strength and the grace, Lord, and the courage to live for you and to tell others about you. If you've done that today, if you've done that listening to this video or in your life, please realize you're saved. God is not, doesn't go back in his promises. He says, you call upon him, you'll be saved. He promises you that. And you will know him and come to him and come to have eternal life with him. If you've done that, please let others know. Let us know if you want, terraingospelministries at gmail.com, please. And we would love to rejoice with you. We can help you send you out some material, um, please. We would love to do that. Um, share this with others. Subscribe. Share this with others. And if you feel it would help them. God bless you. We love you. Keep looking up. We are in desperate times today. We are in dangerous times, and it's going to get harder and harder. Much deception, much more pressure coming. And the Lord says he's coming back for those that are his, and he's coming very soon. So don't be deceived. God is not mocked, Galatians 6 and 9. You will reap what you sow. If you want to sow false gospel, you're going to reap the anathema of God on that. Please don't. If you want to sow seeds of false hope, you're going to reap that. Terrible. But don't do that. Turn to Christ and live is what the Bible says. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in the next video. And please let us know and share this video with others. Thank you.